let us join in a spirit of meditation, reflection, or prayer as we deepen into our service and share our opening words for this morning. This reading comes from France, Francis Moore Lape and is titled, Food is Our Most Common Bond. To me, d democracy is an exciting living practice, what we do every day. To most, democracy doesn't relate to our daily lives, and it sure isn't much fun. I now see that to engage in democracy, to jump into this living practice, we all need something tangible to act on. Because food is our most primal need and our common bond to the earth and to each other, it can ground us as we stretch ourselves to draw in all the interlaced threads so that we can weave a whole meaningful picture for ourselves. With food as a starting point, we can choose to meet people and to encounter events so powerful that they can jar us out of our ordinary ways of seeing the world and open us to new uplifting possibilities. Okay, so today we will have the pleasure of welcoming Sophie Asbury. Sophie is an archaeologist whose study focused on feasting in, a, in ancient civilizations. Hello, thank you for welcoming me today. My name is Sophie and I'm an archaeologist. My study primarily focused on feasting in the southwestern United States. And I'm also a master gardener here in Bismarck. So if you have any questions about plants or ancient civilizations, <laughs> hit me up. <laughs> I wanted to follow up the uh, land statement from earlier with the corrected version of Thanksgiving. When the pilgrims landed on, in New Plymouth, they did not come to an empty, pristine wilderness. They came to a land that had already seen white faces for 200 years. The village that they landed next to was empty because they had been impacted already by the diseases brought by white men. That winter, they lived on their boat ship and the food that they found, that they received from the Wampanoag people was given posthumously. They found it in the village that had been emptied. So as we consider, it wasn't the pilgrim's fault that they landed in a place that they had no idea had already felt the impact of colonialism, but they still benefited from it. And I believe that that is a lesson that we can take to heart. I know that many of us, my family didn't arrive in the US until about 100 years ago, but we still benefit. And when we think about Thanksgiving, rather than offering gratitude to our native neighbors, sometimes we must take a step back and say, what can we do in restitution instead? because they do not deserve our gratitude. What was taken was not given. So <laughs> just wanted to say that. And now let us turn to feasting. When archeologists study feasting, the first thing we assume is that there were feasts. Why? Why do humans share food? When you think of it in an evolutionary terms, other animals would hoard the food for themselves to benefit them and their family. But humans are different. We have society. And we know that when one benefits and we share it with others, everyone else rises also. And so we find feasts, we find gatherings and sharing food ingrained in every, every culture in wonderful ways. And we find that then that food and sharing also comes into ceremonies and our traditions. And you have to think back, what was the dish that reminds you of your family gathering? Why is that so impactful? Because the food we eat 
that sense memory is one of the strongest memory triggers in humans. And so it creates a shared experience instantly. When you see a friend, remember that dinner that we went to? Or your family, remember that one casserole that grandma used to make that we never figured out quite? And they know instantly. And it is a connection and a shared community building um, tool, essentially, for our society. And so that is why archaeologists, we assume there are feasts. How do we find a feast when there are no people left? There is only things left behind. Of course, in the garbage. <laughs> Let's be honest, it's mostly garbage is what archaeology is about. Um, in one case study, let's look to Stonehenge. It's a very well studied site. And nearby to Stonehenge, there was another wood henge, a living henge. And this is where the people that built that archaeological site went and stayed when they were working on it. And they came from all over England and Scotland. And we know this because the Stonehenge event was a bring your own pig event. And so when we examined the pig bones left behind using isotope analysis, we find that they're from all over the country. And all of the pigs are about the same age, because we can tell that. <laughs> and so we build this narrative of people coming from all sides of a vast island, bringing their pigs with them, you know, telling their child, all right, you're, in, you're on pig duty, we're gonna walk a long way, and going to this site in the middle of England and participating, building memories, having feasts, making connections, probably swapping a little DNA, <laughs> And where they stayed in this wood henge, in this living henge, was down a natural geographic road, a lane made of chalk in the ground. And when you travel up that lane and crest over the hill, that is where Stonehenge is. And you begin to see that the people who brought their pigs and had their feasts and helped move monuments that they participated in ways that we find hard to imagine until we start with that one thing, that meal. And so they brought their meal, they brought the stones from the nearby river and dragged it up the lane. And then they walked up that lane on the solstices and had their celebrations. We don't know what those were exactly, but we know that there was a community there and that community built itself and grew and came back year after year. And we know that from their feast. My studies personally in the Southwest United States focused on ceramics and I know that we're having a little gathering after this. And as you go and get your food and you consider the bowl, then consider what it's you're taking from. Are you taking from a serving platter that is meant for a community? Are you taking from a cooking pot for your family? When we study feasting, and meals, we have to do it indirectly, right? But there is a difference between what is used in the family and what is used in a community in terms of vessels, just their size. When you consider how big a hand is versus how big a serving platter is, um, that is how we would, um, sorry. <laughs> That is how we would get at the presence of feasting, because if it's just one family and they stay within themselves, there's no need for these larger vessels. You know, what is the Thanksgiving platter that comes out? 
once a year. Think about that as, and what that's going to look like in our archaeological record when we go. You know, will they find the fish plate? <laughs> The, or the TV trays. Yeah, what will they think of TV trays, you know, in 200 years? So these are my thoughts on Thanksgiving, on food and feasting. I'm open to any questions if anyone has any. I was lucky enough to participate in excavating a kiva in the southwestern United States. For anyone who doesn't know, that is an underground house or ceremonial place. And there we found a large burnished black pot that was incised with great designs. Um, we And it was whole. The entire Kiva had one way that um, ancestral Puebloans would leave a place is they would ritually close it, usually with fire. So you find many burnt, broken, um, collapsed buildings, but this pot had survived whole. And we were able to excavate it with its contents and do a residue analysis, although I wasn't, I don't really remember what the residue was, probably corn, let's be honest. <laughs> but um, but that that was something special. Um, with that, we found a very interesting, um, just archaeological side note, the paw bones and heads of coyote and foxes, because there had been pelts hung in this building, and they were found nearby to that bowl. So, yep, that's... Go with him first. <laughs> what kind of what kind of food do you prepare for others, and what do you anticipate the memory will be that they will have of that opportunity? My go-to potluck dish is a chicken, a Southwest chicken salad. Um, usually. I hope that they just take home a memory of the textures and the flavors and the uniqueness of that. My question is kind of similar, but as an archaeologist, when you're making choices about the things you 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 know, like utensils or bowls or platters or anything that you use how, do you think about it in terms of what will be dug up and known about me and how does that change your choices from a material standpoint i'm really curious about that i am that that's totally fair and i totally do think about that all the time um, oh nick and i okay so nick and i play a game we well we play two games the first is what will future archaeologists think of this naturally and the second is would our ancestors have recognized this food Ah. Um, but yes, I'm very, yeah, <laughs> I'm very conscious of the impact that our consumption has and where that ends up. Um, there's a wonderful book, it's called Pollution is Colonialism, that I recommend anyone who is interested in sort of um, that area read. It's very wonderful by a Native author and scientist so yeah I, I we definitely consider <laughs> what is this weird thing i've got a, a comment and a question I, mm -hmm. i've been reading a lot and one of the books that came popped up that on uh, my audio and it was talking about preparing for hard times and you you mentioned that with the colonial uh, colonists coming over and the person was saying that we need to be ready now. And one of the things that we're supposed to do is leave behind the low hanging fruit in case something bad happens, like leave sources, easy sources of food and fuel for the next generation. So we shouldn't be digging up all the coal, not just because we shouldn't pollute, but because if something collapses, that will be the easiest thing for the next generation to start their civilization with otherwise it's we, true yeah. we, we've got to leave the easy stuff behind and um 
the food, I have a question and we are in North Dakota, we are, I mean, our, our soil is our, you know, best in the world. So why when I'm starting my garden, why do I have to buy dirt? Like, why can't I just use the dirt that we have? Isn't this? So that is a complicated question, but in Western North Dakota, we do not have the best soil in the world. It is very heavily alkaline, which means very basic. There's a lot of clay in there. Um, for example, if you were to try to grow blueberries, don't even think about it. They have, they, they have boxes. They buy their dirt and mm -hmm. they put them in above bed ground. And I'm going, you're in Fargo. Why do you need to do that? Fargo is a bit different. They wouldn't have to. Um, you could spend some time developing your soil. You could introduce worm castings, worms. You could mulch very heavily for a few years, and that would largely amend it, and you could grow anything in there. Uh, but if you're starting from basic, if it was just grass or a new development, then you're going to need to put a little bit of love into it before it can <laughs> really thrive. So I need to buy the poop in order to yeah. buy the poop, get a friend who has a horse, something yeah. like that. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. And yeah, that, the best Mother's Day present I've ever gotten was Conrad's. You had the kids make those um, those worm boxes for, oh. for Earth Day, and that was our Mother's Day present. That was the best Mother's Day present. Ever. For sure, yeah. <laughs> This is a little related, I guess, but my question is, what's the biggest difference you could characterize from like these ancient civilizations and like our relationship to food now? The seasonality, I think um, we're a global society and we expect that we can get lettuce on demand. Um, in large part, feasting, celebrating the harvests. These are all things that grew up out of the seasonality of the planet. Because one person cannot eat all of one harvest, and we must share it out and bring all of us up. And so we have lost that, I think, that celebration, except for, to be fair, some gardeners, there's always more green beans than you need. But yeah, well. We don't talk about this one. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the seasonality and I think valuing what we have in its time and in its place, I think has gone away a bit, I think. And this might have started with the Victorian trade network when we started to value what came from away and what was costly to bring. When you think about how pineapples were worth more than their weight in gold, you know, to Queen Victoria. And I think that we have lost that deep appreciation for things of our own place and in their time. <laughs> I just, it was interesting what you were saying about um, this holiday, Thanksgiving, I'm reading the newest Louise Erdrich novel, The Sentence, and it's really good. It's really joyful, which is nice because the last novel I read of hers was not, and I almost turned away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she, um, they, they threw out it just really consistently without explanation, call it Thanksgiving. And I thought that was really interesting. I was really struck by it. And um, just your point about it is so interesting to um, not give thanks, but to provide restitution and how we can talk about that and maybe have some suggestions like we're traveling this Thanksgiving to a cousin and there'll be kids at the table and how how do you how would you present that like how would you talk about that not just because I'm always I like the you know what what are you grateful for I think that's super mm -hmm. important practice but how do you say what are you going to do right how do you talk about that without well in how do you introduce that to kids what would you say gratitude is in many ways an internal practice it's something that we practice for ourselves it's wonderful i think 
we have to think about um, restitution as an outside practice, as an action. So we can talk about it when you go and volunteer at the soup kitchen, when we even talk about it like this, that that's an action to say, let's take this action to remind ourselves how to present it to children. It's tough because it's not an easy story. Um, I didn't tell all of it. There was one Wampanoag left from that village and several years pr prior, he had been taken as a slave and taken back to England where he learned the language. He managed to make his way back. And he was the one who arriving back, finding his village gone, showed the new people in New Plymouth how to farm and how to live in this new landscape. And who can say, maybe he thought I can, my village is gone, but I can help these people. That was a gift. What came before, what came after, largely not. But we can talk about how these people were more complex and more interesting than the stories that we have told, the lies that we have told. Because the Wampanoag as a tribe weren't gone. There were other villages. They made treaties with the newcomers. And those treaties were where the first Thanksgiving actually occurred. They did have a gathering. They, it lasted for three days. It was mostly men. <laughs> it was a martial treaty of mutual protection against the surrounding tribes. Explaining that to children, I understand, is difficult. Um, I don't have an easy answer for you. It's not an easy topic. Uh, the question from the chat, what foods you anticipate will disappear soon? I'm thinking bees in danger, etc. The pollinator problem is on many people's minds. Um, I would urge anyone who can to make a pollinator garden or just grow flowers whenever you can, wherever you can. We are additionally facing a climate crisis and that is changing food production on a very vast scale in ways that I don't think we're quite feeling the impacts of yet. Um, not here in North Dakota, but they are feeling it down along the Gunnison River Basin where it's run dry. We are seeing desertification, which is making deserts where there were none before in some of these areas. And that is because of human impacts, humans using water to power Las Vegas or water to power their lettuce farms in California. Golf courses. Golf courses. Don't get me started on golf courses. <laughs> um, I anticipate that a lot of our unseasonal foods are going to become more scarce because right now the U.S. has a very established round of, oh, we're getting lettuce from this area right now, and it's shipping all over the country. And that is becoming disrupted. If you've even noticed that sometimes you can't get your bagged salad, you can't get your other fresh ingredients, it's already happening. We can alleviate that by supporting more local efforts. There are several really good local farmers who will do the, um, the community supported agriculture, the CSAs, you can get farm boxes and have regular um, vegetables. So, but that, that's where I see it coming is we're seeing a lot of climate change impacts in the quite near future. We will now extinguish our chalice with these words. The Fine Art of the Good Guest by Jeffrey A. Lockwood. 
We are all visitors, even when we are home. Our time in any relationship or place is ultimately limited. We are passing through. Nobody stays forever. How might we act if we consider ourselves guests in the lives of friends and family? Being a good guest is rather simple in principle, but occasionally challenging in practice. One begins by demanding nothing more than the bare elements of life and dignity, which every host is more than delighted to exceed. The good guest then simply allows the other person to be a good host, to share his gifts, to play her music, to tell his stories, to show her places, and to serve his foods. Finally, a guest should cultivate and express genuine gratitude. In it not be effusive or exorbitant, only sincere. We might also think of ourselves as uninvited, but not unwelcome, guests of the planet. And I think the rules for being a good guest of the world are just the same. Ask little, accept what is offered, and give thanks. There's a river flowing in my soul, and it's telling me that I'm somebody. There's a river flowing in my soul, heart. There's a river. in my soul.